Tonight I would like for you to please pray and ask God to speak to your heart tonight and allow him to share his heart with your heart tonight and allow him to teach you from the word of God. gather tonight for the preaching of your word. We pray that your son would be honored and glorified and lifted up. I pray that I would preach what you want me to preach. And I pray that it would come across with the Holy Spirit's power. I pray that it would be clear, simple for the youngest to understand, and for the oldest saint to be encouraged and convicted, strengthened, and empowered through your word. Father, I need you. We need you not just for this message, but, but for every breath we breathe, for every second of every day. And so this time, these moments, these few next moments are no different than any other time in our life when we need your help. So speak to us tonight from your word and allow us to be a little closer, a little bit more closer to Jesus Christ when it's all said and done. And we ask these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. What if? What if on a normal morning you woke up to find out that the house you've been sleeping in, the people you call mom and dad, that little no good brother of yours, that rude little sister, all those aunts, uncles, Grammy and Papa, what if one day you woke up and you found out you were adopted? <laughs> and every person that you thought was your family member actually was not your family at all. Now, we may chuckle at that, but do you recognize that that happens almost every day? Because there's no right or wrong time to tell a person that they have been adopted. But what if? What if the person that you call mother for the last 12, 13, 14 years sits you down one day and says, I am not your biological mother? What if? The person you call daddy for so many years says, son, daughter, I don't know how to tell you this, but I am not your daddy. What if? You know, life is filled with a lot of what ifs, you know. What if? What if the person that you are married to right now was already married and never told you about it? Wow. What if? What if? What if one day you came down the aisle as a preacher was preaching and proclaiming the word of God and he was preaching on hell and he was preaching on the cross and he was preaching on salvation. And you came down an old-fashioned aisle and you said, what do I need to do to be saved? And the person takes you aside and says, you need to confess that you're a sinner, admit that there is a punishment for your sin, ask Jesus Christ to, who died for your sins, ask him to forgive you of your sins and to save your soul. And you get up. And you believe that you're gloriously saved. You go home and you throw away all of the bad stuff that you have in your home. You tell all of your friends and all of your family members that you got saved. 
all to find out that there's no such thing as salvation. What if? What if? Would you take your Bibles with me, please, and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. First Corinthians chapter 15. As pastor started his message this morning and he said he was going to the book of Matthew, I said, Amen, praise the Lord. And then he started to go down this list and said first Corinthians 15. And I held on to my seat hoping that he would not preach what the Lord had made of my heart. And thankfully, if you're like me, you probably would have forgotten that anyway. So praise the Lord tonight. What if? We want to stand and we're just going to read one verse of scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you don't stand, please. First Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 12. I'll read it, then I'll have you read it, and then we'll read it together. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Okay, let's let you read it now. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? All right, let's all read it together. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Thank you, you may be seated. First Corinthians, the author, of course, is God, but God used the penman Paul to write First Corinthians, which he wrote to the church at Corinth. A, a, a small or basic um, outline of the, the book of 1 Corinthians starts out with chapter number 1, which talks about positional unity is by faith in Christ. Then he goes on to chapter 2, and he speaks about how God revealed and now teaches his wisdom through the Holy Spirit. And then in chapter 3, he talks about carnality and spiritual production in God's temple. In chapter 4, he talks about antagonism and criticism toward the communicator of Bible doctrine. Chapter 5, he talks about separation. Chapter 6, lawsuits. Christians were suing other Christians. <clears throat> Chapter 7, deals with sex, marriage, the status quo. Chapter 8, knowledge and love, sacrificial food, and the weak believer, and the law of liberty. <coughs> Chapter 9, God's communicator should be well paid. But the ministry, not money, must motivate him. Chapter 10, Israel, an example. Idols and demons, the law of liberty and the law of profit. Chapter 11, headship and authority. Chapter 12, chapter 13, spiritual gifts. Chapter 14, the purpose of spiritual gifts. And not, they are not to be abused. The church at Corinth had many problems. The church at Corinth had a man who was sleeping with his dad's wife. It was not his mother, but it was his stepmother. There was a guy in the church who was sleeping with his stepmother. They had some problems. They had issues. And throughout all of this, Paul is dealing with each issue as it comes up, and he's talking to them, and he's speaking to them about each specific issue, dealing with it from Scripture. And it seems as though even though chapter 15 is not the last chapter in the book, it seems as though Paul summarizes everything in chapter 15. And the summary is this. Did Jesus actually resurrect himself? Like I said, chapter 15 is not the last book of the chap of the uh, not the last chapter of the book. But it's almost as if it is the culmination of everything that he has stated before. 
And the question somehow arises in this church at Corinth, is there really a resurrection? So first of all, tonight, I want to explain to you what is the resurrection. Several thoughts. The word resurrection means to arouse, to cause to rise. To arouse from sleep, to awake. To arouse from the sleep of death, to recall the dead to life. Now, several thoughts about the resurrection. Just a basic, simple understanding of the resurrection. When we die, our soul goes either to heaven or hell, and our body stays on earth. Our body will eventually deteriorate and go back into dust. But there is a time around the rapture, around the end time, when our soul will be reunited with our body, and we will be given a new body. We will be given an indestructible body. In fact, if you look at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, speaks of the, the rapture. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So that this mortal body will become immortal. This corruptible body, which is dying every single day, will one day be resurrected, and we will have a new body. And Paul says this, the Christian life hinges on one doctrine. You hear me? The Christian life hinges on one doctrine. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Christian life does not hinge on prayer. The Christian life does not hinge on anything other than is Jesus resurrected from the dead. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and let's answer this. Let's look at, first of all, proofs of the resurrection. Chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Now, if we are to prove a resurrection, we must first prove a what? Yeah. A death. No one has never been resurrected who has never been dead. So we first must understand that Jesus Christ had to die. And that's what Paul says in verse number three. But would you believe that there are people who try to say that Jesus Christ did not actually die? Here are some theories. Some say that there is, they call it the theft theory, that someone stole the body of Jesus Christ from the tomb. But in Matthew 27, 62 to 66, those same Roman soldiers guarded the tomb. Actually, let's turn there. Matthew 27. I want to show you this, this section. Matthew 27, verse number 62. Matthew 27, verse number 62. The Bible says, Now the next day that followed, the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver, they're talking about Jesus Christ now, we remember that that deceiver said, While he was yet alive, after three days I will arise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulchre, the tomb, 
be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, he is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, ye have a watch. Go your way, make it as sure as ye can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. These were the best soldiers in the world as Pastor spoke about this morning. And trust me, ladies and gentlemen, if they set a watch over something, recognizing that if Jesus had gotten away and they had stolen his body, they would be put to death, these men guarded that tomb well. Nobody could have stolen the body of Jesus Christ. And on top of that, all the disciples, when Jesus was being um, um, uh, in the courts with the false trials and everything else, all of his disciples forsook him and fled. They were all scattered. They were scared. So you're going to tell me now, these scared men are going to run up against these Roman soldiers to steal the body of Jesus Christ? I don't think so. So that's the theft theory. Then there is the impersonation theory. They're stating that someone impersonated Jesus Christ. So that when they saw Jesus, that someone was impersonating Jesus Christ. Question. How could you impersonate the scars in his hands? How could you impersonate the hole in his feet? How could you impersonate his back being um, split, uh, sliced and opened up? How could you impersonate all of those attributes of Jesus Christ? The answer is it's impossible. Someone else said there is a hallucination theory. It says those that saw Jesus were only hallucinating. Interesting enough, as we're going to read, as we're going to read in a few seconds, over 500 people saw Jesus at one time. So you mean to tell me all of them were hallucinating at one time? Impossible. And finally, one of my favorite ones, the swoon theory. They say that Jesus only fainted and came to while he was in the grave. <laughs> now, if you think about this, as one, as one author put it, if Jesus, with holes in his hands, the amount of blood that he lost, his side pierced, his feet with the holes in it, was able to wake up, walk, push the stone, and get away from the gods? He said, that's a bigger miracle than him coming back to life. <laughs> Impossible. Notice now what Paul says in verse number 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 4. says, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Then Paul now brings some proof. That's why I call this the proof of the resurrection. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. Cephas was actually Peter, another name for Peter. Then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles that I'm not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Amen. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believe. Paul says, look, here is the proof. Several people saw him. Over 500 people saw him at one time. The apostles saw him. Cephas saw him. I saw him. Paul said, he is, he did die, and he did raise again. But if you're honest with yourself, with no one else around but us, have you ever thought, what if everything that we're doing is just a bunch of foolishness? Now listen, don't raise your hand. Don't stand up and say, amen, preacher, that's me. 
have you ever really wondered? Does it really make sense that a man's death 2,000 years ago affects us today? Does it really make sense that we pray to somebody in the sky who we can't see? Does it really make sense? Can we say that when we have our prayers answered, it's not just a coincidence? That's where the Corinthian church was. They were at a place where false doctrine had gotten in, and these men were proclaiming that there is no resurrection. But when you say that there is no resurrection, you're also implying something else. Because notice what it says. Now, here is the prominence of the resurrection. The prominence. Why is the resurrection so important? Notice verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you, some false brethren, some, well, not brethren, some false prophets, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, if I could have, you know what I would have done? I would have gotten some dominoes. And I would have put some dominoes, not, not a loss of paper, I put some dominoes right here. And you know what happens when you set all the dominoes up? When you hit one, all the rest fall. Paul is going to set up a list of domino, a, a domino effect to show you how important the resurrection is. Because Paul is saying, if there is no such thing as a resurrection, first domino. You say, there is no resurrection. First domino effect. Verse 13. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then, if, then is Christ not risen. If there is no resurrection of the dead, if you do not believe in a resurrection, then Jesus Christ is still in the grave. If there is no resurrection, Jesus Christ is dead. If there is no resurrection, we are wasting our time asking Jesus to save us because, as the man said, he could not save himself. Paul said, now, if you say there's no resurrection, you've got to be careful because when you hit that domino, here's the next domino that's going to happen. If there is no resurrection from the dead, then Jesus Christ is not resurrected. He goes on. Next domino. If there, verse 13, but if there be no resurrection from the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain. All right, first of all, if Jesus Christ is not risen from the dead, sorry, Joya, your song was wrong today. Sorry. Nice song, sounded nice, but you're 100% wrong. Because he is just in the grave like Muhammad and Buddha and Confucius and Haley Selassie. He, he is in the grave. If Jesus Christ, if there is no resurrection, then Jesus Christ is still dead. And if he is still dead, all this is vain. Every youth conference, every camp, a month of missions, where we get preachers from the island to come and preach about missions, all of our preaching is vain, worthless, if there is no resurrection. Our preaching is vain. The, 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 the Bible colleges are vain. Christian schools are worthless. Me and Pastor might as well go sell cars. <laughs> Sign pin motors, here we come. Might as well sell phone cars. Sell phone cars. Top ups, the top ups, the top ups. Inside joke, inside joke. If there's no res resurrection, our preaching is vain. Uh, Paul's preaching is worthless. Billy Sunday, William Carey, Charles Spurgeon, Dr. Mills, Pastor Adams, Brother Reem, you name it, Pastor Sweeting, you name it. You have wasted your time in preaching and preparing, and you've wasted your time sitting down and listening to us talking food. 
If there's no resurrection, if there's no resurrection, Jesus is still dead. If Jesus is still dead, our preaching is vain. Then next, next domino, verse 14. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. What is faith? Your faith is a strong, strongly held belief in Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. That is in vain. You, you recognize this? If there is no resurrection and Jesus Christ is still in the grave, we have a prayer list coming out. And on that prayer list, we have to pray for lost people. Do you recognize that if Jesus Christ was not resurrected, we're praying for lost people and we're lost ourselves? <laughs> pray for my lost uncle. Pray for my lost auntie. Pray for my lost daddy. Pray for my lost mother. And by the way, pray for me. Because I'm lost. You were handing out tracts telling people how to get saved and you yourself was lost. You took people over on the side here and led them to Christ, and you need someone to lead you to Christ. Well, not even to Christ, because he is dead. If there's no resurrection. What if? What if one day you wake up and you found out that everything you've been doing for your entire Christian life was in vain? You recognize there's some more dominoes, domino effects, right? Yeah. Verse 14, and if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain. Then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we have found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. Now, there are two ways of looking at this. Number one, we are lying on God. Yeah. We're telling people that Jesus Christ is risen. Resurrection Sunday. Come to our services. Resurrection Sunday. We are lying on God. Because God did not raise him from the dead. If there is no resurrection. Right. So that makes me a liar. That makes you a liar. Now that's bad. <laughs> To be lying on God is bad. Do you recognize that that could also imply something else even worse? We are, the Bible said, yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. We are either lying on God or we are lying for God. And it's actually God that has perpetrated this lie and we are telling people this lie that Jesus Christ is alive and we're doing it for God and God is the liar and we are his false witnesses if there is no resurrection either we are lying on God or we are lying for God. Wow. Next domino that comes down. Verse 16. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. It reiterates what's already said in verse 13. Verse 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Only a sinner saved by grace. No, sir. You are still a sinner. You are still lost. You are still bound to a slave master called sin. You are still on your way to hell. You have no redemption. No one has paid for your sins. No one could pay for your sins because the only person that could have paid for your sins is in some tomb in Golgotha or some tomb in Calvary. If there's no resurrection, you are still a sinner. You're still lost. There is nothing in your life that can say you are on your way to heaven, if a heaven even exists. 
You believe there's more? <laughs> I tell you, everything hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse, up, verse 18. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. I can't wait to see some brothers and sisters, Sister Gardner, Mom. Can't wait to see Sister Gardner, eh? <laughs> but unfortunately, Mom, if there's no resurrection, Sister Gardner in hell. If there's no resurrection, all those people on that dark wall are in hell. Jim Cooper, who started this church, is in hell. If there is no resurrection, but if there's no resurrection, then Jesus isn't resurrected either. So all of those people that you're hoping to see someday, they're burning up in hell. <clears throat> waiting for your arrival. Last one. Last domino that's going to come down. Verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, if that's our only hope, Say, preacher, the only thing I'm holding on to is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my all in all. He's my everything. He's my alpha, my omega, the beginning, the end. He's my savior. He's my friend. He's my all in all. He is my only hope. The Bible says if Jesus is your only hope, if there's no resurrection, and Jesus is your only hope, we are all men most miserable. You know what that word miserable means? When you go to the hospital, and there's a person dying of AIDS, and you look down at them, you just kind of shake your head and just pity them. That's what the, the word means, miserable. We ought to be pitied. Oh my. You had your whole life when you could have been out there partying, having sex out of wedlock. You could have been drinking and getting high. You could have been having so much fun, but instead you decided to give 10% of everything you made to a God that doesn't exist. You've given your Sunday mornings, your Sunday night, some of you, your Wednesday nights, your Friday nights, your Saturday afternoons to a Savior who is still in the grave. Oh my for you. And then there are some in other countries who are being killed and stoned and raped. Why? Because they name the name of Jesus Christ. And if all they would say is, I don't believe in Jesus Christ, they would no longer be persecuted. But they have taken the persecution because they're holding on to this hope in Jesus Christ. The Bible says, ah, oh boy. Poor lady that that lost her husband because he would not deny that Jesus is the Son of God. Oh, my soul, you need, oh, my soul, you need to be pitied. If there is no resurrection, Jesus Christ is still in the grave. If Jesus Christ is still in the grave, our preaching is in vain. If our preaching is in vain, your faith is in vain. Yeah. If your faith is in vain, then we're lying on God or we're lying for God. <coughs> if there's no resurrection, I am still in my sins and on my way to hell. Yeah. Yeah. If there's no resurrection, those that have gone on before us are now in hell burning up for their sins. Mm -hmm. And if there's no resurrection, when I walk past you, you should wag your head. Say, oh my, look at that fool who gave his life for a man who couldn't save himself. If we do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and if there is no resurrection, this whole Christian thing was a waste of time. But Paul comes back and he says, okay, here, here's the first part. The first part is Jesus did die. And Jesus did resurrect. The second part was if you don't believe the resurrection church of Corinth, here is the repercussions. Here is the domino effect if you don't believe this. 
But now he goes on. He goes with the purpose of the resurrection. He says in verse number 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Okay, well, when I heard that, when I heard the first fruits, of course, when I hear the word first, that means, you know, like, the first. But then I was thinking, Jesus wasn't the first one to be, to, to, to be resurrected. You had Zarephath's son in 1 Kings 17. You have the Shunammite son in 2 Kings 4. You have the widow of Nain's son in Luke 7. You had Jairus' 12-year-old daughter in Mark 5. Of course, a lot of us know about Lazarus in John 11. Tabitha, also known as Dorcas in Acts 9. Eutychus in Acts 20. So Jesus wasn't necessarily the first one, although some of those were afterwards, but Jesus was not the first one. People were raised from the dead in the Old Testament. So how could Jesus, who came on the scene in the New Testament, now of course he was in the Old Testament, but physically he did not come on the scene until the New Testament, how could he be the first fruits of the resurrection if people were resurrected before him? That don't make any sense. How you could be the first of something if someone else was first before you? The term first fruits does not mean first in order in that sense. Here's what it means. Jesus Christ was the first to raise himself from the dead. All those other people needed someone else to raise them from the dead. Jesus Christ did not need anyone to raise him from the dead. Jesus Christ could say, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Jesus Christ had the power to raise Lazarus, and he had the power to raise himself from the dead. So he is the first person ever to raise himself from the dead. Secondly, you may not believe this, but Brother Gary, guess what happened to all those people who had died and resurrected? They died again. All the people like Jesus or Paul or Peter or whoever, uh, Elijah, they raised them from the dead. Wow, what a miracle. Yeah, but they died later on. Yeah. Jesus was the first person yes. to be resurrected yes. and to never die again. Amen. Amen. Never die again. That's why he is the first fruits Amen. of all them that slept. Because no one before Jesus Christ ever resurrected themselves and no one before Jesus Christ could ever say, I am resurrected from the dead and I will live forevermore. Only Jesus Christ Amen. could make that claim. Amen. Therefore, he is the first fruits Amen. of them that slept. The Bible says in verse number 21, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, also Jesus is the prototype of the resurrection. In other words, all the other resurrections will follow his resurrection. So that means this. Every person that will be resurrected henceforth will never die again and will have an indestructible body. Right. Say praise the Lord, hallelujah, right? Hallelujah. Not for everybody. Turn me to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Not everybody could say amen to that. John chapter 5, verse 28. John 5, 28. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life. Yea, man, hallelujah. And they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Remember what we said earlier? The resurrection means that you will have an indestructible, incorruptible body. Your body will be no longer able to die. So while we're up in heaven and we're with Jesus 
and we're with this one and that one and that loved one that went ahead of us and Sister Gardner and this one and Jim Cooper and all these other men and women who've gone before us. We are in heaven forever and we have an indestructible, incorruptible body that will never see death again. Amen. But there will be people in hell burning in the fires, feeling the flame, feeling the hurt, feeling the pain. And they'll never be able to die again. Because they have a resurrected body. Never to see death again. And while our resurrected bodies are in heaven, their resurrected bodies will be in the lake of fire. And your family members, and your co-workers, and your classmates, and your neighbors will live forever in the lake of fire and feel all the pain. Because they too will have a resurrected body. Jesus Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. He made re the resurrection available to all men, sinners, unsaved. Verse number 24 to 25, the Bible says the next purpose for the resurrection, then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all and power, for he must reign, till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Now this shows, uh, this probably is speaking about the millennium period, when Jesus Christ will reign for a thousand years on the earth, and at the end of that time, then he will uh, be able to put Satan and uh, cast him and death and hell all into the lake of fire. But what I love about this fact is this. Jesus rose from the dead because he still has work to do. He still has work to do. And you know what he has work to do with? One of the things, the Bible is speaking about him being able to get the whole world to a point where every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. When all of the wicked people will be cast into the lake of fire, Satan and all his demons will be cast into the lake of fire, and then everything will be subdued and everyone will be praising and worshiping God. And that is what this verse is talking about. I want you to get the context. But I am thankful tonight that Jesus is alive. Amen. Amen. Because I still need him to do some more work on me. Amen. And I know that this verse is talking about something slightly different, but the application I put to myself, he is alive because he still has work to do on me. He's not dead. See, if, if Jesus Christ were dead, and if he didn't resurrect, then nobody could help me. I can't help myself. Nobody could help me. But Jesus is alive. Amen. And he puts people in my life. And he puts situations in my life. And he directs me to portions of scripture for my life. Because he's still working on me. I am a work in progress. I am not completed. I have not reached the pinnacle of salvation. I, am not, I have not reached the height of maturity in my salvation. I still have a long way to go. But thank God, I have a Savior who is willing to make the long journey with me, helping me every step of the way to become what he wants me to be. And I love the fact that Jesus loves me so much, and God loves me so much, that he is taking time every minute, every second of every day, because he loves his son so much, and he wants me and you to look just like him. So that when we get to heaven, we can all kind of resemble the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't quit, Christian. You say, preacher, man, look at all the mistakes I've made. He's still working on you. If I had a voice like Miss Paul, I would have sung that tonight. <laughs> Like I said, he's still working on me, right? <laughs> but I thank God that you might not be at the place where you want to be spiritually, but he's still working on you. 
And maybe you don't have all the clothes in your closet that you want to have. But he's still working on you. And maybe you have some old CDs and some old friends that you ain't get rid of quite yet. He is still working on you. And maybe you blew it. You did something so stupid you could beat yourself up for the next hundred years. Don't beat yourself up. Confess it and move on. Because he's still working on you. And what else does the purpose of the resurrection show? Verse 26. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Jesus resurrected to prove that death, as it says further down, in, uh, if you turn the page over to uh, verse 55, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead, he proved that death cannot win. Death no longer is victorious. We can no longer be afraid of death, you know. Here's what we got to say. When I die, I'm going to be with Jesus. For me to live is Christ, and to die is dead. Hey, if I stay here on this earth, I will serve Christ. When I die, I will be with Christ. No longer do you have to be afraid of death. No longer do you have to be afraid of anything. Because Jesus Christ resurrected, proving that death cannot win. So that even if someone comes in here tonight and throws a bomb in here and kills all of us, we need not be afraid. Because when our eyes open up again, the next face we'll see is Jesus Christ. So death, I'm no longer afraid of death anymore. Now I may be afraid of how I'm going to die. I don't want, you know, I don't want to drown. I can't stand drowning. When I, when I dream, and if I dream I drown and you wake up and you can't breathe, I don't want that. So I may have a little fear of how I'm going to die. But I'm not afraid to die. Some people say, I, I said this the other day on a Friday night, some people say, don't put mouth on me, babe. Guess what? You can die. You can die, you can die, you can die, you can die, you can die. You will die. One day, you will die. You can die tomorrow. Don't put mouth on me! You can die tomorrow, you can die tonight, you can die the day after tomorrow. You can die before school reopens. You can die before Christmas. You can die. You can die. You can die. You can die. Guess what? If I die, I'm going to be resurrected again. So death, you lost. So I'm not afraid of death. Because I recognize that when I die, I will one day be resurrected to, to my body. And I will be, when I die, this soul, my soul, even though my body may be here, my soul will be in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. So what does all this mean? You mean Paul wrote all of this just to prove that there was a resurrection? So we come to church today and we had Resurrection Sunday all for the point of just coming to church and hearing about the resurrection. And possibly. So we leave here tonight saying, hey, I've heard about the resurrection two, in two services today. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Is that the point? I don't think so. Because everything in Scripture is given for us once we intake the information now we got to do something with that information so back to 1st Corinthians